say, we stopped those fascist racist riots. It wasn't the police, it wasn't the swift sentencing, it wasn't the government, it was people mobilising against fascism and racism. That is how you beat back fascists and racists. It's people power and we've got to keep up this fight. Now, we did an amazing job. We defeated them last week. But we've won the battle, we haven't won the war. Because these fascists and racists are going to keep coming back. Because this is just the start of a Labour government. We all know when a Labour gets into power, fascists and racists, you know, kick off, take to the streets. And they're doing it very quickly, very swiftly, very violently now. And we've still got at least another five more years to go. So this is just the start of our movement and we've already seen the hallmarks of an embryonic fascist movement. You want to know how Nazi Germany started? It started like it did last week with riots, with pogromist attacks on libraries, on places of worship, on uh, Jewish people. Exactly the same as what we saw. So we've got to nip it in the bud now. We can't wait for it to snowball out of control. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we've got to call out the racism and the Islamophobia because racism in Parliament is leading to racism on the streets. And there's no room for complacency, right? We've got to mobilise against them. They're, they're threatening to come back to central London and up and down the country on the 28th of September. What are we going to do? Stop them! We've got to mobilise against them. We've got to get into our workplaces. We've got to get into our local communities and our local trade unions, but we've got to organise against them. And we can't wait for fascists to come to town before we start organising against racism and fascism. We've got to get organising so they don't feel even confident enough to step into our towns and local communities. But where they do rear their ugly heads, we've got to be out on the streets, so we've got to say no to racism and unite against racism and fascism. But in many ways, the racism that we're seeing in Parliament is worse than the racism that we saw um, in the late 1960s and 70s because just like Ian e. Powell's Rivers of Blood speech led to the growth of the National Front, racism in Parliament now is leading to racism on the streets. But it's worse because Enoch Powell was on the fringes of the Conservative government at the time. He was sacked from the cabinet, but now you've got rivers of blood, Enoch Powell racism at the heart of the Tory government from people that look like me, unfortunately. I mean, what is that about? People like Suella Bradford, former Home Secretary, stirring up with Islamist threat and this and Islamist threat that and stop the boats this and invasion of the southern coast. That's the sort of racism that is leading to racists to take to the streets and carry out violent attacks. Let's be clear. And don't get me started on that Nigel Farage and Reform UK. I mean, my guy earns over £1.2 million on side hustles. And then he's got the audacity to blame asylum seekers for, you know, people being worse off and the NHS and education while he's sitting on, you know, millions of pounds. What does he know about British people? Nothing. He's got nothing in common with ordinary British people up and down the country. So we've got to call out these millionaires, Tories and Nigel Farage, former UK racists, and we've got to say, look, they're just lying and they're stirring up racism, wrongly blaming asylum seekers, Muslims and other uh, black and Asian communities for problems in society that were caused by Tory government and caused by Reform UK and Nigel Farage politics, which they exactly support exactly what the Tories have done over the last 14 years. So we've got to call that out. We've got to be clear about that. So I've got three messages for you. One, get ready to mobilise because they're threatening to come back to in London up and down the country on the 28th of September. Be ready to mobilise and whenever they mobilise, we've got to be there to stop them and get organised in your local communities. Two, we've got to unite. We've got to unite against racism and fascism. Now, I don't agree with the Labour's uh, government's approach because they haven't been, you know, calling out the racism and Islamophobia. 
but we do want Labour to be standing on the streets with us. And we've got to force them into an alliance and say you've got to stand up to racism and fascism because, to be honest, it's in their interest. They can't compete with, you know, Reform UK and Tories when it comes to racism. So you might as well mobilise people that actually will vote for you and mobilise on, a, you know, an anti-racist basis. And thirdly, we've got to challenge racism, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism because we've got to remember that racism towards one community leads to racism towards all communities. So. Unite against fascism and racism and stand up to racism, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sally. So, we've spoken about the mobilisations up and down the country and the far-right riots as well. And the far-right threatened to attack a refugee hotel in Wakefield, but we were there to defend the refugees from the fascists. And we've got someone who's come all the way down to London from Wakefield. I want to give a big up to Andy Brammer from Wakefield Town Council. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Samira. Th and thanks very much for the invite. And I felt it was really important uh, to come down um, today to be with uh, you guys. And one of the things I do want to say, first of all, is thank you. Thank you, because what a difference a week makes. Yeah. What a difference a day makes in these circumstances. Anybody who wasn't frightened, who didn't feel fear in the last two weeks, I don't believe it. I've been doing this for 40 years. I've been doing this since the National Front in the 1970s with the Anti-Nazi League and the British National Party when we shut down the Welling headquarters and the EDL. I've been through all of those battles, but I've never felt as afraid as I did two weeks ago. And that's nothing wrong with saying that you feel afraid. Now, I'm not afraid of fascists, but I am afraid of fascism. I'm not personally afraid of confronting these people, but I am afraid of what they bring to our streets and what they bring to our communities if they go unchallenged. And you may have seen you will have seen the horrific scenes all across the country, but particularly in Hull, in Middlesbrough, in Sunderland, very close to where I live. And only two weeks ago, 20 miles down the road in Rotherham, a thousand people led by fascists attempted to storm a hotel with asylum seekers in it. They set fires to bins, they tried to murder. This was like Rostock. This was like Kristallnacht. Yeah. This was like the burning of the synagogues in the 1930s. That's what we faced. And on the back of that, you'd think they'd be ashamed, but oh no. The day afterwards, they announced that they were coming to Wakefield to do the same thing at a hotel in Wakefield, just down the road from where I live. So we called a meeting, like I'm sure you've called meetings all across the country. 50 people turned up. And you could already sense this was on the Tuesday. You could already sense that the fear was turning to anger and that people felt the need to do something and they wanted to do something. And over the next few days, we organised and we organised and we organised. And one of the things I have to say is the massive importance of you young people, yeah? Because the majority of people who organised that were young, mainly women and young Muslims as well that organised that demonstration. On the Tuesday, I met with the police, threatened me with Section 14 notices, you're not going to have a demonstration, it's not going to be allowed, it's going to be violent, all that kind of stuff. I went to meet the police on Thursday morning, after the Wednesday night, I think if he had dead, he would have hugged me. <laughs> because they knew who turned the tide. I was sat with my old mum, 87 year old, on the Wednesday night, watching the news, her talking about when her mother took her to the cinema as a small child to watch the newsreels of the Holocaust and that stuck with her all her life and then the pictures started to come in on social media I'm going to cry in a minute because they were tears of joy when we started to see Bristol Walthamstow <laughs> Brian <laughs> you felt the tide was turning you felt the fear was changing sides. You felt our side was on the offensive. 
And this hotel that we have in Wakefield is a way out, it's on a motorway junction. It's hard to get people there. We got there early, an hour before the fascists said they were going to turn up. And the people were coming off buses, people were coming cars, people were, different organisations were giving people lifts in there, people from the mosque, the LGBT group from Leeds were bringing people over there. There were people in, there were people in wheelchairs, there were people on walking sticks. It was the entire spectrum of the people that we want and need at this demonstration. We stood our ground for two hours in the blazing sun against the fascists. And I tell you how many fascists turned up to show the face, not fucking one of them. And that victory is all our victory. You did that. It's what you did across the country that gave the people the confidence to do that. But they're not going to go away. We have to do it time and time again. One of the most worrying things to me is the amount of youngsters that were involved in those fascist demonstrations. It feels like the 70s, the early 80s. I remember them days when they thought fascism was cool. We've got to make anti-fascism, anti-racism cool again. Through music, through culture, through uniting. And we will smash these bastards. Thank you, Andy. making anti fascism cool again, so big up to Andy. Okay. So, so right, I'm going to move on to our next speaker. We've spoken about far right thugs in our streets. And in 1993, with the rise of the Nazi Fascist National Party, we saw the far right thugs gain confidence and launch racist attacks on the streets of London. And one of those attacks was Stephen Lawrence. And now I'm really honoured to invite our next speaker. Our next speaker is someone who I'm sure needs no introduction, the father of Stephen Lawrence, a fearless campaigner, a fighter against racism, against police racism, and someone who's still fighting for justice today, who was smeared by the police, smeared by the press, but still is joining us today. He's joining us on Zoom from Jamaica. So I just want to give a massive round of applause to Neville Lawrence. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. I'm 5,500 miles away in Jamaica. I'm there with you. But most of the people there can remember, for the past 31 years, my life has been turned upside down by people like these ones who are trying now to kill people who come into the country. I came into London. I came into England in 1960. I lived in England for over 40 odd years, nearly 50 years. I'm now in Jamaica because of what's been happening to my life, with the killing of my son, and the struggle to try and find people who actually kill my son, plus to send them to prison. And as everybody knows in that, that crowd now, that only two people so far over the last 31 years have been sentenced to serve time for the murder of Stephen. We are all people, we are all human beings, no matter what color we are. And if you really think hard enough, we are all brothers. We were all came from a family who was in the heart when the world was destroyed. So when you look at somebody, although the color might be a bit different, they are still a human being. I'd like to congratulate all of you people who are there today to let the wider public know that you're not going to stand up while your brothers and sisters, no matter what the color they are, are being persecuted. We came to England, our soldiers went and fought in the wars, after the war. We came to England to try and help the country get back on its feet. Some of the work that we did while we were there, other people didn't want to do it. We, we went on the buses, we went we went to the hospital, we swept the roads. We are all one people. And when somebody tried to say that we are not one people, 
I'd like to find out from these people who we are then, if we are not one people. So, keep the fight going. Although I'm not there, I'm with you. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak to you. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to announce our next speaker. So we've spoken about the far right in Wakefield trying to build a base and another one of those places where the far right was able to mobilise in big numbers and has attempted to build a base time and time again but has been beaten back by anti-fascists and anti-racists like our next speaker every time. Our next speaker is Chantal Lunt from Liverpool. She's a councillor and also from Merseyside BLM. So give it up for Chantal. I just want to start off by asking, are we okay? Yeah! Yeah, I think we need to normalise asking each other right now, are you okay? Because yeah. I'm sorry, Sharon in finance. I don't want to talk about the web right now. My whole community is being under attack and I think it's okay to ask people of colour, are you okay? Yeah. Because we're not okay. And we're not going to be okay for a long time because what's happened over the past two weeks is not okay. It is wild. I was away in Cornwall when this started, when the tragic incident in where I live in Merseyside, South Port as part of Merseyside, happened. And within a week, it felt like I was coming back to a region that I had no idea how that was where I came from. Because we've got a strong history, haven't we, of beating back the far right. Last time they marched in numbers, they left in the luggage compartment, terrified of us. So how could this happen right here, right now? And that's what we've all been asking ourselves. How could this happen? But has anyone, just put your hands up if you saw this coming. Put your hands up if you saw this coming. So many of us saw this coming. I remember 2020 standing in rooms in Merseyside saying, they will not come to the city first, as in Liverpool. They will come to the outskirts. They will come to Nosley, where I live, because that's the area of highest deprivation. There was a Tribune magazine article recently that said, seven out of the ten most deprived areas in the UK rioted. And that is not an accident. The far right are studying those maps, they're finding where the areas that have been deprived of funding and resources are, where people are angry, angry at the circumstances, angry at the cost of living crisis, and they are weaponising that anger and turning against people like me in the community who have nothing to do with it and are in the exact same boat as them. But then they say stop the boats. They say stop these people from coming. And we are exhausted as people of colour. I'm like, did 2020 BLM not happen because we told you this was coming? We absolutely told you this was coming. And the fear that gets me is if you study history, you know that this is history repeating itself because there were riots in 1919. Economic downturn, people turned against people of colour. There were riots in 1948. Economic downturn, people turned against people of colour. There were riots in the 70s. Economic downturn, people turned against people of colour. Protect our women, they're taking our jobs. It's the same narrative, it's just a different community every time. So when I say we done told you, I mean it. We told you this would come. But what are we supposed to do now? Because everyone just wants to carry on, like the past two weeks haven't happened. It feels a little bit like don't look up, like yeah, the violence is off the streets, but it's not out of their hearts. And these people who were happy to stand outside asylum seeking centres and stand outside hotels, yeah, they might not be as bold to do that anymore. Because I was there on Wednesday, we turned up in thousands and stood on the street and defended our centres. And just to go to the last point that's been made, the police literally put a statement out saying, don't go, yeah. don't come. It's just bricks and mortar. It's not just bricks and mortar. They're our community centres and they're people from our communities, so we will go and we will defend them. And then afterwards, they wanted to claim the victory. Well, yeah, we did it together, no mate. You were over there telling us not to come out. You couldn't have done it without us, so you wind your neck and we'll be out each and every time. Yeah. Every time we'll be able to defend you. But I just want to finish on this because the bit that gets me, and as many of you know, my son was targeted and by the far right and, you know, they threatened to kill him and damaged our property. 
The bit that gets me is that we now live in a society where the generation that's come behind me are experiencing worse racism than my generation did. Are we going to put up with that? No! Are we going to put up with that? No! We will not stand for it. We have to get these fascists out of our communities, but we can only do it together. We can only do it by uniting because the same people coming for me are the same people coming for my are the same people coming for the silent seekers, are the same people coming for LGBTQ plus communities. They're the same people who despite saying they want to protect women, who are beating up women in the homes. These are the same people. And until we unite against them, they will continue, they will continue to push on the edges of our communities and that's where we need to be. Yes, be in the towns, be at the rallies, be at the marches, but also be in the community, be out there doing the educational work, the work that is less glamorous but much needed right now. Because only when we unite can we defeat them. So I'll end by saying this, a quick chant, but before I do my chant, I just want to say one more thing because there's so many people, you know, you catch the eye of people for a while, you're out, don't you? And everyone's, everyone's got their head a little bit lower. They keep telling us to go back back to where we came from, as if our people didn't build this country. Yeah. Yeah. As if our people did not prop this country up time and time again. And to them I say this, we are going nowhere. We are going nowhere, so hold your head up high and know that you belong here and we will defend you and we will hold the line for the next generation and make the world a better place for them because united we cannot be defeated so let's go the people united will never be defeated 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 today because you represent the real British people not those thugs so big applause to you and thank you you made me feel so proud last Wednesday in Walthamstow last Saturday it was wonderful to see thousands of people coming all out together to protect the mosque Fensbury Park Mosque seven years ago I don't know if you remember our mosque Muslim Welfare House was attacked Makram Ali was killed, unfortunately, and 12 of our members was injured. The threat is real. It's not a joke. 
We Muslims live in environment of fear. And guess what? Fearing of the attack, this environment of fear, is worse, is tough, is tougher actually than the attack itself. It's not a joke. When you are a Muslim and you represent an Islamic organization, you go to a bank and try to open a bank account. Do you think they will open for you? No. These tax did not come out of nothing. The attacks did not start two weeks ago. It has been building up for years and years and years. You go to so many newspapers, I'm not going to mention the names, and you see a Muslim beheaded an elderly woman. It's a real title. A Muslim, it was sick. Somebody who was not even a Muslim, but he was yet called Muslim. The big title did what it did. And then, apology, a small, very tiny paragraph in the third or fourth page. Ah, Muslim plot to kill the pup. It's real titles. So these people, the fascists, the racists, have been building for what happened last 10 days, many years ago. Can we allow them to do what they're doing? No! No. Is racist acceptable? No! Are immigrants welcome in this country? Yes! Yes. Tell me, who is not immigrant in this country? Yes. All over the world. Who is not immigrant? Are the Anglo-Saxons immigrant? Yes. Yes, they are immigrant. Are uh, the Vikings are immigrant? Yes. Uh, William the Conqueror. Is he an immigrant? Yes. The royal family. Are they descendants of William the Conqueror? Yes. So who is not an immigrant in this country? So their narrative is just, uh, I'm so sorry, stupid. Little bit of history, little bit of knowledge. You will know we are all descendant of immigrants, whether you live in the country, whether, whether you live in Africa, whether you live in France, we are all immigrants, whether we like it or not. And are the immigrants the cause of poverty? No! Deprivation? No! And it's just problems? No! No, we are not the cause of the problem. problem. It's the failure of the government, conservative, Labour Party, all of them, unfortunately. There is real failure to sort out the real issues of people's life. And who to blame? Immigrants. Are they really the cause? No! No, they're not. So the government not to do something to change this narrative that the immigrants are responsible. I have a few things for you. One question which is very important. Paul, do you think Islamophobia is a crime? Is it a criminal offense in the, under the UK law, Paul? It's not. So you think, you are saying to me, Islamophobia is a crime. I have to tell you, under the British law, it's not a crime. There isn't even a definition of Islamophobia. The government, the current or the previous government, did not recognize or create a real definition for Islamophobia. It's not a crime. Shame. 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 It is shame. So, me and you have work to do. Today, we go home, we relax tomorrow morning, Sunday, we have nothing to do, we wake up, we start writing letters, sending emails, speaking to our neighbors, taking to our local councillors, speaking to our local MP, and saying to them, why don't we recognize Islamophobia as a crime in this country? We have to. So this is number one work to do. Number two, are we happy with the freedom of speech? Yes, we are but not when we see these consequences. Yes, yes. The fake news, the fake news that's spreading out around like a fire cannot be, cannot longer be tolerated. This fake news, huh? this mask is saying that you can inevitably go into a civil war. Do we want a civil war? Ah. No, we don't want a civil war. That's why someone like Musk, like Tommy Robinson has to be stopped. So me and you have work together to do. We have to impose control on the media, all the media. You know what happened now? They play with our mind. Before, Tommy Robinson, there's no way you can think they're going to go out and smash windows and burn up shops and, and, and hit women and burn up mosques and go to hotel and set fire on it with people inside, immigrants. Because they're immigrants, oh, they're okay, they're animals. They're facts too. No. What BBC is doing is horrible. What the media is doing normalization of yes. these atrocities. Yes. They are playing with our minds without even us realizing what's going on. They are normalizing. So it's normal, it becomes the norm to see these stacks burning up a mosque, it's normal. Is it enough? No. Any black person. Is it enough? No. Any brown person. Is it enough? 
is going to go further and further and further until it comes to you. Do we live in this kind of society? No, we don't want to live this kind of society where your sister, your mother, your daughter can, is not allowed to go outside or leave her house because of fear. I'm scared, I cannot leave. We can't live in this environment. That's why second duty that we have to do, me and you, is go back and we have to impose control. Yes, for freedom of speech, yes. But it has to be controlled. Cannot be. We cannot allow them to spread rumors, rumors that will affect our community and girls unpunished. No. Musk, Tommy Robinson, Nigel Farage, those people have to stop. They have to assume responsibility. If their, their action, their words, will lead to any kind of atrocity. Those tags outside are not responsible alone. They are not. They have someone behind them well protected by the laws, well protected by our own government. Three. Third one, very important point. I cannot believe that the far right narrative become the mainstream politics of this country. I was born in four years for decades actually, that we are following the footsteps of France. And we are very soon going to Italy, my lady is from Italy, where one third of the parliament is represented by the far right. Do we accept the far right to be members of our parliament? No. Are they welcome? No. no. So we have to do something for it. Yes, you did great work. Yes, you were the stand up to racism, were the heroes of the last two weeks. We show the whole world that united, together, stand up to racism, stood up to those races and stop them from attacking our neighborhood, our Muslims, our friends, our black people, our brown people, everyone. Everybody is safe, everybody is equal, there is justice and fairness. But how can we allow those politicians to go again, talking, saying whatever they want, without being punished? Cannot be. So me and you together, the third point, the third actions that we have to take together is to say them no. No to fake news. No to spreading out hatred. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm really honored to invite our next speaker is also someone who needs no introduction. But we are delighted that up the road, there's been an MP for 41 years, who has, been, who has always stood with refugees, who has joined every anti-racist protest, who has always fought against the far right and fascism. And he's joining us here today after the people of Islington rightfully re-elected him. Give it up for Jeremy Corbyn MP. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to follow Neville and to my great friend Tufik on what they've just said. And it's great to see so many people here tonight united to stand up against racism in any form within our society. And it's great that 10,000 people have already signed that statement. We need that to grow very rapidly to many, many more signatures and we need to build those in a local community as well. Now what happened over the past two weeks was terrifying and frightening. Anyone that's looked at the videos of the way those uh, ghastly far-right mobs broke into that hotel in Rotherham, for example, it wasn't the only place, tried to burn it down knowing there were people in there, trying to attack people knowing that they were imprisoned in their rooms in a very vulnerable situation indeed. And they were trying basically to destroy their lives and destroy their hopes and everything else. And the very sad comment made by uh, a man who had come from Afghanistan thinking he'd have a place of safety in Britain said he'd never been so frightened in his life as what happened to him in that hotel. This happened this year in Britain, 2024. And those uh, far-right mobsters, because that's what they are, are essentially creatures of two things. One is a great deal of money that has been put in the way of Stephen Yaxley Lennon, who himself is residing in a very expensive hotel in Cyprus. I hear it's 400 pounds a day in the hotel that he's in. 
and he, in a sense, is directing operations from afar. The wealthy putting money into far-right extremists is not new. It was done in Germany when far-right gangs attacked Jewish workers, Jewish business people, and synagogues in the 1930s. It's always the way that the wealthy pay the thugs in order to do their dirty work for them. And that is what's happening at the present time. But the other question is that those thugs have some misplaced idea that somehow or other the underfunding of their communities, the overcrowding in schools, the waiting lists at doctors, the waiting lists in hospitals, the inadequacy of universal credit, the removal of the heating allowance from quite a lot of elderly people, and all the other things that are happening in society, the levels of debt of young people, the high levels of rent in the private sector, the sense of depression in society, is somehow or other the fault of those people that have fled to uh, evade human rights abuses, environmental destruction, disaster, and wars, many of which Britain has been involved in. Somehow or other, they morph into the horror of all those situations as being the responsibility of those people that have sought a place of safety. And somehow or other, by burning down an asylum hospital, it's gonna make things better. Of course, it's nonsense, it won't. It will just make the situation worse and worse and lead us into a desperate, horrible, highly polarized society. And so, the response of so many people that came out in Southport after the mosque had been attacked to paint the walls, to fix the windows, to rebuild the wall, to clean the place up and give support to those people that are going through hell is a wonderful example of working class solidarity to a Muslim community that is under attack from the far right. And we have to remember that ultimately it's solidarity that will bring a benefit in all this situation. So it's building that solidarity that is so very, very important. And then the events that we held last weekend uh, outside mosques all over the country. We held a very big one at Finsbury Park, and if you were there last Saturday, thank you very much for coming along. And remember that the Muslim Welfare House, which Tufik represents here today, was itself under attack from, the, from a far-right individual extremist. Well, he presented himself as an individual extremist um, in 2017 when Makram Ali was murdered by that far-right extremist. It's not new what has happened within our area and our community. So it is important to build the strength of an anti-racist movement. But before I go on to one other point about causes, I just say this, that any of us here uh, able to understand the situation and have come here tonight as an act of solidarity, and that's good. And when we have to build a big movement, that's even better. But we are able to understand and contextualize historically and economically the situation that people are in. And whilst many of us may go through individual uh, levels of abuse and concern and stress, it's much worse for people that don't necessarily have that sense of community or that sense of understanding. I was talking to um, a man in my constituency three days ago. He is somebody that has not had good fortune in life. Um, he's not had good fortune ever since he came to this country from Somalia. And uh, he is deeply stressed and frightened to go into a park because he doesn't know what might happen to him. Frightened to walk down the street on his own because he thinks he might be attacked because he's seen all this stuff on the, on the media and the papers. And I met Muslim women over the last few weeks who are afraid to go out at all, have somebody else bring their shopping, try never to leave the house because they feel that sense of fear of what might happen to them should they go out. Now, that fear and that um, horror story they've been through isn't going to go away 
next week, week after, the week after. It's going to be there at the back of their mind for a very long time. So when we build our anti-racist movement, we have to understand how anti-racist movements were built before. The 1930s, when uh, the fascists tried to attack the Jewish and Irish community in the East End of London. Those communities organized back, fought back, and stopped Mosley from marching through the East End. Those that stood up with the black community in Notting Hill in 1958, during the race riots there, when uh, Mosley once again tried his tricks on people. In the 1970s, there was a very significant rise of activities of the National Front, all based on an economy that was changing, deindustrialization, loss of certainty in jobs and so much else. And uh, the National Front gained in 1977 100,000 votes in London in the GLC elections of that year. Some of us organized against this, very quickly, Bernie Grant, myself and many others organized the Wood Green protest march against the National Front. From that came Lewisham and from that came the Anti-Nazi League and the huge movement of Rock Against Racism and all the other ways of popularizing a um, unity in our society. And that was a crucial factor in beating the National Front back. They changed, they changed their names every so often into different things, they're the EDL, and of course their, um, their uh, how should I put it, uh, pleasant representation is the Reform Party in Parliament which got four million votes in the election. And I listened very carefully to Nigel Farage's first speech in Parliament. I was sitting sadly fairly near him but not near enough to be in camera, not near enough to be in camera shot. Um, he described his constituency, that's what newly elected MPs should do. He did that quite well, described what it was about, described the levels of poverty in Jaywick Sands and other places, correct, then seamlessly decided to discuss immigration, refugees, asylum seekers and boats coming over from Calais, without at any stage saying the boats from Calais are the cause of the problems of people in Jaywick Sands, but anybody watching it would very quickly get the message of where he was coming from, what he was trying to do, and where he was whipping up the hate against those people that are just desperate to seek a place of safety. So politicians that blame the boat people for our problems, disgraceful and disgusting, those people, and I've met many of them in Calais and other places, they're just desperate. They're victims of a war, they're victims of human rights abuse, they're victims of poverty. They want to live and contribute to our society. Can't we stop denigrating people and start treating them as fellow human beings? And to me, these things are very essential. The language you use and the sense of inclusion we bring to everything that we do, that is crucial. What I would also say, and I'll conclude with this, is that over the past, um, particularly the past eight months, but actually going along much longer than that, there's been this huge growth of people who are prepared to go out and march week in, week out, to call for a ceasefire in Gaza and justice for the Palestinian people. Whatever the weather, they're prepared to go out and do it. Those, those people, yes, they're marching for Palestine, but they're also marching for the kind of world they want to live in. A world where we're free from war, where we're free from exploitation, and we're free from the horrors that it brought upon the poorest people on the planet by the commercial exploitation of them. They, without being named, labeled, or in a party, are actually a movement of themselves. Likewise, all of those of us, and I'm sure everybody in this room was part of it, came out in support of the rail workers, the postal workers, the teachers, the civil servants, the hospital workers, and all the rest who took industrial action over the past couple of years, also a part of that movement. So as we build our anti-racist alternative to the barren horror that is put before us by Farage, by the far right on the streets, 
then we must make sure that we also address the economic, social, housing, education, health, mental health, and all the other issues that all of our communities face. You have to bring all of the issues together. Bring them all together and unite people in that movement. And so the huge turnout to oppose the far right last week, a week before last, was very significant and very, very important. But we're gonna to have to do it again and again and again. Because they will rise up again, they will try again, they'll be more organized next time, they'll have more money put their way, and there are people who have a vested interest in seeing this kind of racism and mayhem take over our society. So it is about inspiring people, it is about inspiring young people. It's also about teaching. It's also about the understanding of history, the understanding of community, the understanding of different faiths, the understanding of uh, the way people live, what their beliefs are, and where they've come from within the world. That is what makes us strong as a community. Ignorance can divide, ignorance can be exploited. And so, tonight, we're meeting together, yes, to have a good time and enjoy some music, but above all, to show that those of us that will never accept racism in our society, will never allow our society to be divided by the far right, are also capable of bringing in lots of other people who can actually enjoy each other's company, enjoy the multiplicity of culture, music, art, sport, and everything else that a, that a diverse community brings to us. And we will defeat the far right. We will defeat the fascists in our society. We will build that better society based on peace, based on justice, and based, above all, on hope. Thank you very much. Our next speaker was there when Stephen Lawrence was murdered and fought for justice. He was there when we smashed the BMP. He was there when we smashed the EDL and Tommy Robinson for the first time. And he's here today as the Stand Up To Racism co-convener, Big Up Raymond Bennett. It's a hard act to follow Jeremy Corbyn, so doing, I'm not gonna try and do that, but I want to say something about what's happened. The first thing is, it's the people that defeated the fascist. And I want to talk about two-tier Britain. I'm sick and tired of hearing about two-tier Britain. Have you heard this thing that the Nazis are going around saying that black people are treated specially by the police? You heard that, yeah? You can smoke a gun in peace because a policeman will never arrest you on the streets of Hackney if you're black. Now, we know this is a lie. It's a racist lie. There is two tiers in society. It's Elon Musk, the billionaire, who comes from apartheid, and it's Trump, the billionaire. There's a two-tier society. There are people who are criminals. Trump is a criminal, but he's not treated as a criminal. Farage is a criminal. He incited that, I'm, I'm just asking a question, in the middle of a riot. I'm just lighting a match on gasoline. We know what these people wanted. They wanted conflict. Let's face it, people like Tommy Robinson have no talent. He was a little hooligan who used to beat up his wife. His first crime was wife beating. That's what he was done for, abuse at home. And these people tell us they're worried about women and children. Why would you burn down a hotel with children if you were worried about them? Yes. Why would you terrorise people on the street if you were worried about them? And we have to say this, we will stand up against the fascists and it's the most dangerous time because you've got Marine Le Pen in France and actually you've also got a Nazi in Italy who by the way was met by the British government. She's a fascist, she shouldn't be treated like that. We have to stand together in solidarity. And that's why I say that the power 
the, the people, I was told that Babylon, the police, are the reason why we're free to walk the streets. Come on. The reason why we're free to walk the streets is because we came out in our thousands, black, white, gay, trans, young, old, Muslim, Christian, Jew. That was where our strength came from. And you know something? I remember looking out in Walthamstow, looking for Nazis, and I couldn't find one fucking one of them. And the reason is very simple. These people are bullies. They used to bully me. I'm not going to embarrass my niece here. My niece is here, so I think we're officially cool, yeah? Because, of, you know, the idea that my niece said that she came to see her uncle here, right? So I'm really glad to say that. This is a family tradition of fighting back against racism. And anybody can join this family. It's about resistance. You must not change. Our weapon is solidarity. Fred Hampton said our major weapon is solidarity. Do not let anybody put their hands on someone who attacks a mosque, a synagogue, a trans, anybody. Because if you stand together in unity, you can break them. And this is the other thing, but we are in dangerous times. I tell you this, if they bring 30,000 people inside the centre of London, we've got to bring 60. We have to bring 60. And we have to do it in such a way as to do that, because if we don't, we saw what happened when they brought 15 into the centre of London. We saw what they did around Britain. And our slogan is never again. And the reason why we say never again is because our strength is unity. Our unity is our strength that pop pushes back against people. And I want to give tribute to all the people that have come up here and, and have spoken. And, 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 I, and I'll leave you with this, right? Each time the Nazis have come, They've come and said we're unbeatable. But then I saw the National Front chased out when I was a kid. And then I saw the BMP, this guy called Nick Griffin. He said he was going to be the Fuhrer. Then I saw him crying and barking with his people <laughs> around him. Then I remember Tom Names, Tom, 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 you know, um, um, Tommy Robinson. You know they said the EDL, the EDL disappeared. Do you know why it disappeared? Because we matched them up. We matched them up. We matched them up in Walthamstow. We matched them up in Tower Hamlet. We kicked these little racist asses and we made them run away. And I remember them wetting themselves as we chased after them. And that's not going to be the last time. That is not going to be the last time. Because we are going to smash Tommy and I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to rip reform apart. You may stand inside Parliament, but we will kick you down if you try. what we're doing, all of us being here. Big up Dalston, big up everyone here that is doing this right now. Stand up to racism. Unfortunately, in 2024, it is incredibly important to be doing this with what we are witnessing in the media. These scenes, it's just, it's disgusting, it's heartbreaking. It is not what Britain is about. It is not about division, it is not about segregation, it is about coming together and the celebration of everything that makes us incredible and unique. Woo! Fuck the right wing media, oh. Yes. So I wrote a speech because I knew that I'd swear. <laughs> and I just went and did it then, but I'll go off a bit here. The stakes couldn't be high right now. What we're facing isn't about misinformation. It's about a full-on assault on the values that make us who we are, diverse, inclusive, and fucking proud of it. 
The recent far-right riots in the UK are a reminder of what happens when hatred is allowed to spread unchecked. And this ain't just some fringe group. This has got someone who has now left the UK and is sitting there in Cyprus, I think he's in, living his life every single day while he creates this segregation in the UK. This, this building of moral panic and fear-mongering about something that doesn't affect him. He just is glory hunter. That's all he wants. He wants the fame from it. He wants the division. He wants the people keep, keep people divided. But he's gone to the other country. He's gone to somewhere else and said that he fears safety because of what's going on right now. Listen to what is happening in the country. The fact that people are outside mosques and hotels that are housing migrants that have fled countries and war-torn countries for a better life and this is what they're getting to see. Shame on him. Shame on Tommy Robinson. Yes. And it is not just about how they create this hysteria. It is the right-wing media and the fact that one man, Rupert Murdoch, has so much power across the UK, not just UK, Australia, America, has so much power to whip this up while he sat there getting so much money from people clicking on the articles and gaining all of it while it makes the country divided. It's disgusting and we need to tackle that. That's one massive thing that needs to change. We should not be allowing one man the power that he has to be able to control elections, control the way that we view each other. Because what Britain is built on, what we are all about, we come together. The fact that we are allowed to have the rights that we have, you know, as an LGBTQIA plus person, we have fought for the rights that we've got. And it is not without saying that these rights are intersectional, you know? These, these conversations are intersectional. Racism, Islamophobia, transphobia, homophobia, it's all part of the same fight and we all need to come together. And that is what this is about, coming here, seeing so much beauty in this room. It's crucial that we understand this intersectionality. The fight against racism is inherently tied to the fight against homophobia, transphobia, and all forms of bigotry. Yeah. The far right wants to pit marginalized groups against each other to distract from the real issues, which is inequality, injustice, and the erosion of our democratic values. <laughs> we need to stand united, and we must reject this divisive narratives that seek to tear us apart and instead embrace a vision of society where everyone, regardless of your race, religion, or sexual orientation is respected and valued. We must demand better from our media, insisting on journalism that informs and unites us rather than inflames and divides. We need to reaffirm our commitment to justice. Empathy is a big one teaching and education and not allowing this to continue because when you look at, so I'm from a small seaside town, I'm from Great Yarmouth, who just voted reforming, which is not good because that is not what the people that I grew up around were talking about. That's not what it's about. The fact that this small marginalized, like this segregated small town has now voted this reforming under lies and this false sense that the reason that they have lack of funding and then the reason that they are deprived is because of immigration, is because of migrants coming over. This, this should not be allowed and we need to be fighting to the media to stop that. Because the fact that they are allowing that, the fact that people like Nigel Farage are even allowed a platform, shame on ITV, do not miss celebrity, allowing him to reform his view of the world is just wrong. Together, we can resist the forces of hatred and build a future where everyone has the freedom to live without fear. People need to stop being yeah! and be more country. Thank you. Stand up to racism, always. We've got it. We unite it. We've heard a lot about building unity, we've heard about the importance of mobilising a 
and confronting the far right on our streets and we have to make a commitment today that every time the far right attempts to mobilise, every time the far right attempts to be on our streets or attack our community, we will be there to stop them. And we need to do more than that though. We need to build a massive movement that is going to push the far right even further back. They're on the back foot now but we've got to push them the whole way. So I want to ask everyone in this room to go away from here, well not now because we've got music, but to go away afterwards and to get organised because we need more of anti-racist organisation. We need to build anti-racism in every area, in every locality, in every city, in every workplace, on every campus and the rest of it. And we need to do that together and united. So I want everyone to also join Stand Up To Racism today to get involved in putting on the protest, to get involved in beating back the far right and also fighting against the racism which fuels them coming out onto the sorry, coming out onto the streets. And together we can win, together we can beat the far right. But I want to end on something about uh, the Nazis that Wayman actually said, has, has said a few times. But I think it's good because now we're going to come together and we're going to, we're going to have music and we're going to dance and the rest of it. We're going to have DJs. And there's something about Nazis. They're nasty, they're racist and we need to send them back to the sewers that they belong. But also Nazis have got no culture. Nazis can't...